start. Uh, welcome back, hope you all have a nice lunch. Uh, my name is Ika Ludlow and I'm just one of the Crafts Council of Ireland participants in the seminar series. Um, and today we're going to, or so the session we're going to be talking about digital craft, I suppose, to, for want of, for serious want of better name, I think, at this point, uh, with Jeffrey Mann and uh, Dr. Vanessa Butler. Uh, so I'm just going to very briefly introduce myself and my background and why this is of interest to me. Um, and then I'll give you a, sort of a brief intro to the topic and to Jeff and Vanessa. Uh, so, my, um, originally, um, I suppose I, my degree was in uh, embroidery. I graduated from NCAD in 2002. Um, and, but at the moment, I run a very small, very, very new company called We Like Sick with two colleagues of mine. Uh, we do uh, print, embroidery, laser cut, and laser cutting for fashion and text, or for fashion and interiors. Um, it's quite commercial. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, we're very new at this hour. We've only been on the boat for six months or so. And uh, we're sort of at the moment, we have our clients range from Marks and Spencers um, to Oscar de la Renta. So it's quite a mix of um, materials, it's quite a mix, it's high end, some quite high end, some quite low end, <coughs> and it's a, um, a real mix of techniques as well. It's just a few, it's a, a digitally embroidered piece of PVC on the top left, uh, it's laser cut and etched, uh, silk on the bottom, and it's just a digital print on the right hand side. Um, I also at the moment work part time for a company called Tactility Factory. Um, this is a project, a product called Gurney Concrete, um, and uh, they're textiles embedded in concrete for interior use. Um, so the, the sort of the services become completely integrated again, since using um, techniques such as laser cutting, as well as traditional print and embroidery techniques. Um, so these are large, large scale panels, um, sort of directly integrated into buildings. Um, so that's what I'm doing at the moment, which is quite a mix of things. Um, but where my interest in uh, how I went from embroidery to more digital things, I suppose, goes back to immediately after I left NCAD, I did an MA in interactive media at the University of Limerick. And um, this was a part of my MA project, uh, was a piece of, an interactive piece of jewellery, which um, combined with a jewellery box and it stored and recorded um, when you wore the, the objects, when you wore different objects, and played back sort of um, abstract patterns depending on your habits and your patterns of wear. <coughs> and it came out of an interest in what we wear and why, particularly with regard to things that we wear every day. Um, so from there, I went, uh, following that, I went to work at the University of Ulster um, in a research centre called Interface. Um, and was involved in a large number, been involved there until um, late last year. I worked there um, on a number of um, collaborative projects, mostly um, dealing with digital print and laser cutting um, for the most part. Um, and really sort of getting to know both machinery and very different ways of working. Um, as well as doing my own work, as I say, I've been involved mostly in collaborative work. The pictures here are from a project called Wonderland, which was a collaboration between Helen Story, who used to be a fashion designer, and Tony Ryan at the University of Sheffield, who's a chemist, and ourselves in Ulster. And um, it resulted, it's, it's kind of a difficult project to explain very briefly, but it was to do with plastics and recycling. And um, over the course of the project, the chemists developed uh, a recyclable plastic which could be dissolved. Um, so, a washing equipment bottle made of this plastic um, could be recycled by the person who bought it. And it could go back through the sewer system and be reconstituted at the other end to be dissolved in water. Um, and we worked on a series of dresses which were part of the information campaign and to go alongside um, this project. Um, Helen and Tony are currently working on a new project which I'm also involved in um, called Catalytic Clothing, which is looking at 
uh, using nanotechnology to make clothes that can purify the air as you walk around. Um, so it's just, these are the kind of things that I've been involved in, so it's a very broad interest, or broad range of projects, but that has always been to do with technology, with science, in varying degrees and in varying ways, and also with, um, with sort of public engagement. <coughs> um, this is some of my own recent work, um, and this is digital, uh, digital ICAT print. Um, and so I've been involved in a number of levels of technology. I've been the person who, uh, who runs the laser cutter, or runs the digital printer. I've been the person who um, gets sent a file from somewhere else that produces work, work for other people. And I've also been the, uh, somewhere in between with, with this work. Um, this is work that was actually produced in Thailand. Um, and the image on the left is the original image that I created, which was then printed on the warp uh, threads before it was woven. And this is what the, the end fabric um, actually looks like. Um, so it's very different to the sort of the kind of digital print in textiles that you probably um, used to see. So I have, having experienced these different kind of ways of working with technology, quite remote in some senses, such as with this one, um, I feel it's like quite very, very hands-on with some other work. Um, I'm interested in the different reactions that I get when I speak about it. Um, people sometimes react very strongly uh, because of the, the process involved, and uh, that's something that I'm really interested in. Um, this is a quote <coughs> about the craft aesthetic from Peter Dormer, wrote in 1998. Um, and said that the craft aesthetic was anti-technology, anti-science, and anti-progress. Um, and I suppose everything that I've worked on in the last five or six years has been pretty much to do with technology, science, and progress. And um, so that's something I, uh, I find very interesting to hear someone talk about a craft aesthetic. And uh, I suppose this is where the idea of King okay, is there, a, there is in some areas uh, a very visible digital aesthetic. Uh, particularly in digital textile print, there is, there has been over the last number of years what could be definitely called more Photoshop aesthetic, uh, perhaps than a general digital aesthetic. Um, but this is kind of where this idea for a discussion about the digital aesthetic within craft um, has come from. I say for me, and then digital technology, whatever, it's just another tool. Um, this is something that Joan Masterson <coughs> has to say about tools. And I will read it all out just to remind myself. Um, their visual results are often instantly gratifying, presenting novel qualities that have not previously been experienced. In the short term, they may impress, but in the longer term, they may turn out to be something that everybody can do, as in the sort of Photoshop aesthetic, shall we say, which has been prevalent recently. Um, this intrigue with new tools is not unfamiliar to a maker seeking a new departure for their work, but it is their mastery over a sustained period of time, making subtle nuances attributable to an individual hand and eye that makes their use significant. And that's why <coughs> excuse me, I think the two speakers we have today are particularly interesting. Uh, there is a subtlety in their work, um, and there is the eye and the hand whether it be from a distance or up close, um, of individuality um, in both their work. Um, they have, this is, in case you're unaware of the, some of the work of Geoffrey Mann. Uh, Geoffrey works, is based in Edinburgh at the moment. Uh, he works in glass and ceramics and at the moment metal, I think as well, sometimes. Um, and some of Vanessa's work. Vanessa works mostly in water jet cut glass. Um, they have two very different approaches to how they use technology. Uh, one is more detached and directed, and one is more hands-on and perhaps a more, you could describe as a more intimate uh, engagement with the materials. But they are both deeply engaged with both the technology and the end results. And uh, today we're going to speak about their processes and about the final products and how they go about their work. So first up we're going to have uh, Vanessa, who's going to speak about her work, and then we'll have Jeffrey. And if we could save your questions for the end, we're going to try and keep some time for more group discussion. 
and at the end, let's step to questions after we start. Hi, um, I'm going to give a little bit of background about myself. I completed my PhD in 2006 at Sunderland. Um, it was the first place, uh, I think, anywhere that uh, purchased a water jet machine for creative application. And it was under the inst instigation of the research that I was undertaking. And, you know, I spent three years without a machine and then it arrived and then I kind of came into my own and kind of flew with it. Um, and up until then, there'd been a, a lot of animosity towards technology. You know, it's an expensive machine, why are we getting it, what's the point of it? And I think what you've seen in the last ten years or so has been an increase and a kind of explosion in the use of technology. I wouldn't say I'm art and science, I would say I'm art and technology. And I'll probably argue that point quite strongly as you as you go through as I go through the, the talk. Um, this is one of the pieces that I um, make. It's sort of very much component wear. Often when you think about water jet technology, you think about multiples, you think about commercial <coughs> outputs that you can make loads and you, you know you can output, output, output. I kind of argue from the other point the other sort of side, by understanding the machine and the processes and the parameters, I can make one-off pieces that have that kind of element of being, some might say unique, I could replicate them, I could do multiples, but there's something about them that have, some, that they're limited, I don't want to produce more, I don't want it to become like the machine is intended to be. My understanding of the machine, the parameters and of the material enable me to really explore those, those, those fields, to try and make work that questions, and then every piece questions again what I'm doing. So I kind of try not to generate the same thing over and over. And I suppose I'm an artist in an academic context because with working in, and lecturing, I find that I have, want to answer questions and then I move on to the next question. I want to kind of find out more. And so the work always changes. Let me see if I can go on. Um, this is the water jet machine that we have at Swansea Met. Um, you can see it's a high pressure. I'll explain water jet. It's a high pressure water mixed with abrasive that enables you to cut. Um, the thing that's different from water jet to laser is that it's no, no heat generation. Um, it cuts at, for any techs out there, 60,000 psi. And in some parts of the industry, when it's used for industrial use, they go up to about 120 now but it's an extreme force and kind of quite dangerous. But, and extremely noisy, but there's something about the machine that I find, to me, it's like using it like a pen. It's like using any other tool that you have. I've just built up a very close relationship with my machine. I know it's not mine, but I kind of, <laughs> I kind of look after it. It's kind of my, it's my pet. And it has enabled me to really to develop my methodology and really kind of show how technology can be important to, um, to an artist's practice in development. Um, and at the title of the speech, I put by informed play if, if, with technology. And what I mean by informed play is very much, um, like I said earlier, I work, I've worked with artists who have dipped into the subject. They come along, they give me a file, I work on it, I cut it they go away happy, but they haven't questioned what the machine and its parameters can do. Through informed play, through me spending 10, 12 years on, on the machine, I have an understanding of it. So it's in telling me what I can do, and I'm telling it what it has to do. And sometimes when you sort of work with engineers, or you work with people in a job shop, they say, well, it can only do this. But when you have that informed time with it, you can actually say, well, actually, you can play around with the software, but you can make it think it's doing this when it's doing something else. And so that, that engagement bring, builds up a whole load of knowledge, that tacit understanding we have of materials and of the processes that we, we, we use, whether it's casting, fusing, whatever we might be doing, whether it's in textiles, we kind of have something. We can't necessarily explain that it works, but it does. I have that same engagement with this great big machine. So it is just, it is another tool to part of my armour of, um, of techniques. This is um, showing some images of the jet and what it does. <coughs> the stupid glass there, about four inches thick. And I wanted to see what it was like at cutting. So by understanding and doing investigation of 
cutting various types of glass, also cutting at various angles, I start to build up an, an engagement, what it can do, how, cut, how fast it can cut, you know, what it might be able to do next. And it sort of helps me kind of start to kind of build up my desk and sort of make in, in great shapes and question what I want to produce. Um, believe it or not, that whole pile of glass is actually from one stack of glass. I've kind of done the internal shape, then I've done another shape, then I've done another shape, and maximising my, my, my uses of the glass itself. And also you can see the difference in the sense of how thin I cut it, it's how the colour changes, how the light hits it. So I, you know, I kind of see, I ask questions like how thin can I cut it? How thick piece of glass can I cut? How deep can I go before it fractures? Can I surface the braid at the surface? And then I just kind of say, well, I've cut a shape, what I can do with the techniques that I've already learned, like kiln forming, so like using cone shapes, what other techniques can sort of take a water jet shape and transform it into something that couldn't be produced without, without the water jet process. But this is just to show you kind of how, when I say it works in multiples, yeah, it works in multiples. There's lots of them. Um, and a lot of people say, well, it's so quick, isn't it? It's really quick. And I kind of go, yes, it is. But actually, I had to reduce my cutting speed by about 50% to get the kind of quality of cut I require. The whole intention of the work that's produced is to be able to not have to do much more to it. So I'm trying to keep the aesthetic of that cut as good as I can get it so that when somebody looks at it, they kind of go, how was that done? Because it will just look like a sandblasted surface. It's not looking like an engineered, industrially cut surface. We try and hide the taper, we hide the kind of mechanisms that is actually being done by a machine. The thing that gives it away often is the fact that it's the shape. <coughs> and also, the possibilities. This is a, a close up of a piece of um, four inch glass. The glass is less than a millimetre apart and he's cutting at a kind of 45 degree angle and for, on a five axis machine and this was done in Missouri um, in, the, in the department of mining and explosives so I get to some really exciting places yeah. you know, not art departments, I go to kind of explosive departments and when they pick you up at the airport they've got explosives on their truck you have, you have security looking at you and holding their guns so, but what happens is I kind of ask those questions, how thin can I cut, what angle can I cut, and then that will engage to, to what is produced later. So I kind of have that understanding of the machine and of the material. And you know, this is, I left this with a friend in, in Corning, it just started to fracture slightly because they were so wafer thin. And it's still interesting to kind of see people going, you, you managed to cut that? And that thing, and it's just like, yeah, yeah. We can come blase about it, and we shouldn't really. But the engagement with technology and the engagement with industry is quite important, and this is through some um, things that we're kind of developing further now is surface abrasion. Architects and, and um, all sorts of people are saying, well, I don't want to cut direct through the glass, can we just do on the surface? And this is something that is going to be researched. With, with the PhD student I have um, shortly. But this is for engagement with industry where I've been let loose on the machine in Rochester. And they have said, well, I need to be able to go down to the surface of glass. Um, can you do it? <coughs> and from an artist's point of view, it's like, yeah, sure we can. Different software, different machine, different type of glass, different, different types of different setup altogether. But because I had an understanding of what the machine can do, I was able to kind of have that dialogue with the engineers and the technologists to say, well, well let's try it like this. This doesn't work. Your nozzle, you know, your brace of feed rate is wrong. Cut off the, um, you know, the vacuum assist. Let's just make a lot of noise, a lot of mist, a lot of water, and we'll get, we'll get an outcome. So it's kind of a two-way street when I work with industry and when I work with businesses. But the end outcome is a lovely surface abraded piece of glass with a lovely end finish that, similar to sandblasting in a way, but it's been able, I've been able to control it and get the parameters that I require and also the companies required. And then that feeds into things like this. This is a piece of glass that's been partially pierced. Oh, it's not bad. Can I see? 
um, where it's the casings are 10 millimeters apart and they don't go all the way through. It's timing on here, I think. I'm not sure. So you can just see these are like bed and nails. I think I can get it and move it. It's like a bed and nails. But only through that inquiry was I able to achieve that. Um, Jeffrey might be different because you say you don't make your work. Two days of sitting by a machine with a hose pipe can be quite demoralising. But the challenge is, is the fact that knowing the properties of the glass, realising I had to reveal the glass because a piece of glass comes to you off the production line, it's supposed to be fine. You know, a piece of window glass, they say fine, no stress. Well, actually, when you're halfway through a piece sheet of glass doing that, it starts to fracture. It's kind of, there's no going back, we're going to start again. But it's also a challenge. How can I get through and do all of that without it breaking, without it cracking? Will the, will the properties of the glass allow that for me? Or will it continue to occur? So like talking to Pilkingtons, talking to structural engineers, um, double checking that I can reveal the glass to a point where there is no stress within it. It's quite important to me because then, <coughs> and it's also a challenge. Because if it starts breaking me again, I'm going to go, I'm going to beat it somehow. This is other work used for, as you kind of are well aware, water jet glass is often used just for cutting out shapes. And for kind of production work, and this is a large sheet of glass. The only way it could be done to recycle the glass was really was using the water jet to enable to get the shape, but also because of the hardness of it, as the properties are toughened um, without being toughened, it's a very difficult glass to cut. But it enables you to kind of work with larger sheet sizes and to make more complex shapes. However, that's not of interest to me. To me, it's about keeping, getting a piece of glass and cutting the internal side shape and keeping the internal shape and the external shape, how I can make the most of that sheet of glass, how I can work with it. And also then, how I can apply the techniques that I've learned as a glass artist to it, like fusing, slumping, controlling it, using using steel formers that have been water jet cut to enable me to get control of slumping with, you know, through the shapes that I've, with, I've been cutting. And then here, like one of the images that was shown at the beginning of the introduction, the spinal wave, comb-like structures that have been put in the kiln and allowed to fall. Now, I can't control that, so there's also this serendipity. I'm not sure what will happen. So sometimes even I'm excited by what comes out of the kiln. And sometimes I'm kind of disappointed and other times I'm amazed and kind of go, yes, I'd like to do that again. And I kind of go, can I do it again? Mm -hmm. Not sure. So you have to be open to um, those accidents occurring. And the technology enables me to do that. It enables me to create shapes and create items that I couldn't do previously. I couldn't produce cone-like shapes um, any other way. And might be sim a simple shape, a simple cutout, but it enables me to make much more sophisticated and supple, supple forms through the knowledge of the technology and the knowledge of my understanding of the material and processes that we are all trained with. You know, when you go off to art college, you learn about fusing, slumping, cutting, um, and then we kind of want to progress and become, want to delve further and become more sophisticated in our approaches. And that's what's happened by, for me, using using this kind of technology. When I talk about this technology, you know, we said it's on a large scale, you know, we could do the size of, you know, a piece of 8 by 4 on, on, you know, plywood or, or wood or steel. And then I get people like Esther, who's at the Royal College, come to me and say, I've got some handwriting, can you cut it? And she says, it's this size, it's about a centimetre in height. Same machine, same big machine, and as you can see, the size of duck marini for hot glass, using it to cut to make small marini for the hot shop. So my investigation when I was doing, especially the PhD, was seeing how it could be applied across all areas of glass, not just architecturally, but also how it could be used in the hot studio, how it could be used in casting, how it could be used in fusing. I was interested in what effect and impact the water jet would have and how it could be applied creatively in that field as a glass artist. And what it's, what it's now bringing to me is totally new ideas and um, seeing about moving forward. Um, through doing a residency at Wheaton, I managed to work with a, a fantastic glass blower called Ethan Stern, who helped me do the colour the color piece, which is now in their collection. And it's going to flip back to 
And then here are some places that, say some places um, like the spine, components stacked together, they're about two millimetres in thickness, so my question about how thin I can cut comes back again, but also trying to make these sort of structures. I'm going to keep on doing this because I don't know why it's looking. And then I'm looking at how it can become more three-dimensional. Um, and to the image previously with the hands is showing I'm still engaged with using my hands as a process. It's not just the machine and the informed plate the machine. I'm also still using my knowledge and my understanding, my tacit knowledge of the other material, of the material and other processes to inform the work. Um, and I hope that I'll helps you or answer some questions for you. That's it. Yes, this is going to be a little bit different because I, when I usually give lectures, I talk about processes and it's uh, a multimedia kind of fantastic journey of all these crazy animations and different technologies I use. Um, but we're going to have 20 minutes. So, this is going to be a little bit different for me, so I'm going to explain a lot about the work but show final images. I don't make my work. Now, I'm not a charlatan, I don't say I'm a craft person, I don't say I'm an artist, but I'm a designer. I'm almost an uh, undisciplinary, undisciplinarian. I don't have a discipline. Yeah. The work gets departmentalized. I don't, I don't allow it to. I don't allow myself to. Um, when you see the work, and then you'll see, I'll talk about the institutions I've shown in as well, the collections I'm in. It's, it's a difficult one. And this also goes back to what Glenn was talking about this morning, is that I'll show a piece that um, I made by email. And when you see the piece that I made by email, that's when you start seeing that this world is very big, very open, and it should be open to new technologies. Um, I'm also not that good at new technologies. So any technical questions, we are very good people to speak to. Is it, when you see it, I'll, I'll explain it more. Anyway, so, I'm going to 20 minutes. So, the background. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Mann, I'm from Edinburgh. Um, I did my Master's role College of Art in Ceramics and Glass. Um, prior to that, I was in Aberdeen at Grey School of Art doing three-dimensional design. Uh, Martin Smith, who's the head of Strands and Glass, must have taken a big gamble. So I went there, I maybe slip cast one object and cast something this size. That was my whole Strands and Glass knowledge. But I went there questioning what they were doing. I was questioning why every year they produce the same things, but just slightly bigger. I didn't see the point. I was, I was very arrogant. I, I kind of came up with this term, catwalk ceramics. And so why, can, why do ceramics have to last 100 years? Why can't they just last a couple of seconds and be thrown away? So this whole discussion that maybe technology allows to create different things, that arrogance when I met Oliver Nair kind of subsided because I was in absolute all of people that were ama just amazing. Um, well, like Esther, the, um, Vanessa was talking about was in, was in my year. Uh, Anna Schuchwald, who's a professor at Cranbrook, he was in my year as well. Um, in fact, me and Anna are very, very good friends now. So I was learning off their experiences. The advantage of me going to the RCA is that because I didn't really know the material properties, I would do anything. I would literally, I always find that if, if I knew how far material can go, people stop. They won't even try and, and try and push it. I'm always a questioner. And when I when discuss with the work, you'll see what I mean. So, not the chat. Um, first, I'm gonna, this is in reverse. I usually put this as the last piece, but I'm showing a brand new um, series of work I've just literally launched. Um, it's got very few animations, so it's going to go last. Um, this is the long exposure series. First piece is called Attract to Light. Um, this is one of my graduation pieces, Royal College of Art. I was really, I'm, I'm fascinated by motion and movement, I'm fascinated by the, the ephemeral, the intangible, something we can't touch. Perhaps that's my training, perhaps I need to touch objects. Or maybe I deny myself to touch material, I don't know. Um, this is a moth flying in a light source. I work with the National History Museum uh, in London. Um, we, we got moths, we glue pins in the back, we've got the exact trajectory of how it flies through space. Um, and then I was interested in how you actually materialise it. Is something familiar? So you've got this object. This has been rapid prototyped in a nylon. I'll be very brief about what rapid prototyping is. It pretty much all it is is three dimensional printing. So instead of just no paper, it does this, it does that, and creates. Uh, this is SLS, so this probably has. It's in microns, the layers. You don't really notice the layering, but sometimes it has like a cuttlefish effect. 
can come in different materials. It can be uh, titanium, it can be nylon. Uh, they've just recently developed rubber prototyping glass and ceramics. So, if you're ever doing ceramics and glass, it could be a different machine soon. This piece is currently, well, it's currently in the Museum of Art New York collection, and it's on display just now, actually. And it was first shown at the Design and Elastic Mind exhibition in 2008, which was a turning point for me because I was surrounded by people that have read in books. And this was a I start to understand that there's work might actually be work. So this is a larger installation called Nocturne. Um, this was part of, um, I was lucky enough to be awarded the Joe Wood Contemporary Makers Prize last year. And there was three bits of work, and you see the next piece of work was there as well. The way I work is that I, I, I do have, my studio in Edinburgh does have a dirt room, as I call it, and that's where everything gets mucky. I have a clean room, that's where I usually spend my time. And there's a computer, there's a screen, but I do understand this work, and I had this very weird and slightly perverse thing that I don't see any of my work until the exhibition. I go maybe a day before and I sit and I have this kind of attitude that I have to, I, I have to see my work again. I have to understand mm -hmm. it. It's like a long lost brother. I, it's a familiarity to the object. I have to investigate it. I just look at it for a couple of hours. I remember, because when I'm working on a CAD model, it's not CAD to me, I'm connected, I'm in that space. I'm walking around something that's three-dimensional. It's almost, uh, you get to a point that it's a very matrix-esque. I can walk around streets and see birds flying, understand the sitting space where I'm saying that. I can understand the birds flying. I can see the exact patterns of motion and forms they create. If you imagine uh, air as being solid, and we're just moving through it, I could probably envision and probably materialize this how you're moving through space. This is just a lot of time looking at a computer. So this piece is about, it's, you'll see there's an installation shop about three meters long. And this piece was made in by Materialize in Belgium, which is a, it's a rapid prototype bureau. They have a, an alternative company, which is more of a company that sells RP objects, but it was about the material for me. This isn't a light. People say, oh, it's, you made a beautiful lamp. I'm like, it's not a lamp. <laughs> um, it's, 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 I never class it as a light bulb to light source because it's about it's an investigation of the form of motion and about how you can make these things uh, tangible and you can touch them. Um, the digital aesthetic to me should not be blob morphic. That is my tagline for the day because a blob morphic object is something there's no connection from the art to. You know how a moth flies. We've all seen a moth fly in our light bulbs. It's something we have an instant connection and all my work has to have that narrative and reason why. And how I do it is the more difficult part. So, I think the next piece goes down. Right, that's a big detail. On the end of the mall, you can see, you see the, the kind of material, material, material kind of, how do you say that, kind of texture there as well. Very beautiful, it's very translucent as well, it's a slight porcelain esque feel to it. Okay, so, this piece is called Dogfight. Uh, I'm not really that imaginative with my name, so I just kind of see what I see. So these pieces are using a technology called subsurface engraving. We've all seen subsurface engraving. You can probably go down one of the main high streets in Dublin and buy, I don't know, I'm trying not to be really stereotypical, some Dublin Irish-esque character in a glass block. And it'll be a paperweight. However, that mach the, the, the machinery that uses that is phenomenal. It's a, a laser that can etch up to something, I think I, there's two million cracks in that sort of glass. That glass is 400 mil high by 200 wide by 150 mil. It weighs about eight stone each, like each block. Um, and it's the most perfect. Uh, the glass without the etching is beautiful. Um, but I, I, I make it on a computer and everything's solid. So you get these amazing happy accidents where you can get this, where's my mouse going? This amazing echo, this trajectory, this kind of, this idea of the moths being and gone. Um, so this, this four glass of blocks of glass that fly through the, the whole blocks of glass. This, made, this was made in Paris by a company called Victrix, who had to get the blocks specially made in China, then shipped across. Then I met them in London. So it was kind of, once again, another weird and wonderful journey for the blocks were coming from. My carbon footprint is terrible. It doesn't work itself. Um, but once again, this this was something I never I never tried before. I knew this I knew the stereotype, and subsequently I made work for Annie Catron, who was at the 
Oh, I see something, it was the exhibition Glenn was talking about at VE, there's something out of the ordinary. Yeah, yeah, she made 12 clouds. Um, I ended up, she asked me, you know, I've created all the clouds and designed all of them. But it was using this idea that just because the technology has such a stigma, does it, it's still phenomenal technology. <coughs> and really nice little bit of information about the technology. They use Lego to register the blocks because Lego is the most um, accurate form of getting a registration because the tolerance is designed to is phenomenal. Anyway, so that's just a little bit of my thought about Lego. So the next piece, there's two pieces, they're called Flight. I'm speaking fast because there's a lot to go through. Um, it's, it was once again as part of the Long Exposure series, I was looking into the uh, Look into my bridge and Larry and flinches about uh, animal locomotion and about how an animal uh, moves through flight, the poetry of motion almost. The first piece I did create, and I'll openly admit this one, I did create it very well, um, but I had to understand it. So this is the first piece I made. This, this is 700 mil long, 450 wide by about 400 high. This is my first time about cast glass. I've never cast glass before, and it was a stupid thing to do because Things such as the mold was half a ton weight. We had to custom build a kiln to fit around it. We had to custom build a drying cabinet. For, it was just, it was just almost a thought of challenge myself a bit at the Royal College at the same time. Not the best thing to do. However, I understood how it was made, and a lot of my work is about understanding why things are created. It's another piece. This has a, it's fully acid etched body, and then the ends, you got, uh, you got this kind of beautiful polishing. The inspiration for the previous piece, Dogfight, came from how the glass whispers inside of it. Because someone says I can, uh, initially came from someone challenged me saying that I can control whispering. So I thought, well, I could probably do it through technology and create the same kind of aesthetic effect. So this, these, there's two pieces that were part of Flight, and they were also part of the Gerwood Prize. With the Gerwood Prize, because it was older work and I was a little bit bored of doing the work, I, don't really create, I only create one or two objects, tops of any series, and then I have to start a game. Because I have a perhaps a low attention span in that sense, and I've got to keep on challenging myself. So I thought I'd challenge myself by not making it. So, and this is talk, we had a discussion upstairs about why don't we use why don't we buy a local craft or use local manufacturers? It's because it's very expensive. And I also when I was trying to make this piece in Britain, nobody would touch it because it just says, oh, we don't know if we can make it." So I went to the best in the world. I went to Czechoslovakia. I went to Czech Republic. I went to uh, Lohotska Studios, and I've never spoken to Lohotska Studios. I've never picked up a phone, I've never been. I never will, I don't need to. The, this piece was made by email, and I met it at the Gerald Prize and Open Private View because I wanted that kind of, and I went to that, and I, I, was, I was absolutely taken back. Um, and at the Gerald Prize, they actually had all the emails we'd ever done. We ended up creating two pieces, the first piece there was something like 25 emails. The second piece there was two. Literally was, how is it going? Fine. The second one is, there's a small crack. Can you fix it? Yes. And that was it. That's all I required because I knew the piece. And when for the, the first part of the email conversation was on the lines of, do you think you can do it? And they went, we're not sure, but we'll give it a try. And that's what it's about. If even the, the the, the producers, which I call, I class myself as a director, and people, the people I work with are producers. So it's an equal billing. Um, these guys challenge themselves, and if they're not challenged, they won't do it. Well, let's get openly, openly um, say that if they don't are interested in the project, they won't even touch it. So this is a, this once again is a very heavy piece about nine stone away um, in a kiln for like forty five days, something like that. Um, I only ever make one piece. Uh, which is once again, if you have a cast glass, an absolutely ridiculous thing to do um, because they usually break. Unfortunately, I have no breakages so far. That's why I've stopped making them. I think my luck's been proud. Um, so, I made this piece. I made the, the, this was the German installation. A terrible mug shot in the background. Um, but as, as it worked, the, the, the pieces worked very kind of airy. I was very, very impressed by what they created because I'd never seen it. And people, a lot of people always question, well, are, should they not be the crafts people? Should they not be kind of uh, commended for this? And I'm like, well, yes, uh, the dream is there. But they don't want to be commended. They don't want this kind of equal billing because it's not their idea. They're working for me at the end of the day. I'm paying it. 
and that's kind of a it's not a kind of it's not a vicious business like approach but that's that's, how, that's the way the world works in a way so why can't it work this way within the craft industry as well one possibility um these the two bar pieces were also shown at the world craft council um no, no, it's not that. the european glass complex in denmark in bornholm they don't know bornholm it's a really small island south of denmark interesting interesting place um and i was looking at the reward of the world craft council prize for glass and there was kind of slight uproars he doesn't make it he doesn't touch it he's never seen these pieces and I was like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But I had a bit more. I was a bit more upset that the people next to me were the guys that actually made it. They actually they had their own work they were showing as well. So there's this kind of morals myself as that reward this prize. But the people, the true artisans in my sense, perhaps the people that made it. I just have this vision, this narrative. So that's another one. So that's the start of one exposure. There's other variations of one exposure series. I've done people running, I've done, I've looked into, um, I'm currently showing an exhibition called Visualising Motion. It was created by Jonathan Miller in London, just now, a historic collection. And it's almost the history of uh, the idea of visualising motion. So it's, they have one of my pieces of work next to one of them, my bridges pieces. And that's for me, is, that's the ultimate accolade, to go next to the, the pioneer of capturing kind of, um, motion, uh, visualising motion. So the next piece is called the Natural Current Series. I put things in series because I think it's easier for me. Um, there's not an animation for this, but this piece is currently in Man in New York in their permanent collection. It's, it's called Blown. And it was just a, a question of materiality. And I was like, well, ceramics is by nature a solid state material. That's just what material is like. People can create, give it motion, the feeling of motion, but I was like, what? Uh, can you actually give it pure motion, or I would call it a true aesthetic? So I, I create this animation and I blew on the cup and saucer as if you're blowing your cup of tea. So that then created these different objects. So you actually see the different stages of how the motion blowing through. So from the animation, I then create uh, a rapid prototype and then I go. Usually traditional slip casting for the ceramics. Now, because I don't. I don't care about the process. I is that if I thought about the process beforehand, it would kind of stop me. It would kind of limit to how I knew it was going to work. And the animation programs, they don't care about reality. They will do what you want, and that's I love that. So I, I create these objects, and I work with ceramicists, and they look at this and they say, "We can't do this because that's thinner. You need equal edges." I'm like, "We'll do it," and it always works because you just need that one person to challenge and with. Um, and the existing discipline. So this piece is called Blow. Uh, this piece is called Shine. Once again, we're really going for the imaginative titles. Um, this was, I'm a bit of a magpie, I quite like shiny things. And I was walking down Portobello Market in London and it's an amazing array of silver and chrome objects. Uh, anything that just blinks and it was, it was reflecting. And I just questioned, I was like, what is that? What is, what is Shine? And there was this idea that it's, it's the reflection itself is an in-between state. It's um, as uh, Gilles Blue calls it, it's a projectile. The object itself is something that isn't the beginning or isn't the end. It's an in-between state. It's almost something that's transient but happens to be materialized. So I was like, well, this is this is it. This is what I'm looking at. What shine is. So I was working with a three-dimensional three D scanner, which once again is just like a scanner that instead of the normal flatbed, the three-dimensional scanner. And I was, I was really interested in how when a laser hits a reflective object, it spikes out. It causes this, um, well, they literally are just called spikes in the industry. And you have these people that despike. I don't know if they're called despikers, but they're called, they take, they almost create what we expect to see. And then I question, I was, I was just simply as, was well, that what actually exists? If you're having to remove what actually the computer is saying, what is true, is the computer true, are you true, what is the real aesthetic? And I like the idea of the purity of the eye, the purity of the computer's eye created this object. However, we understand and this sense of familiarity with the spikes. So each spike is actually how, or how intense at these certain points the reflective object was. So the, it's less about the, 
The candle is just a holder. It's the spikes that have actually materialised and they're the thing I'm actually proud of in this piece. So, it's another piece. I don't like doing awards, but I got asked to make some awards for the Arts and Business of Scotland. And it was in Aberdeen. So the obvious thing to go for Aberdeen is because uh, Aberdeen is, is oil. The place is made on oil. Um, so it's really interesting actually looking at how I could... There's, if you go on my website, you'll see all the animations that back up this and justify the work, but I'm going through this piece quickly for you. Um, I was interested to see if every single piece, because it was about this unification of Scotland, everyone coming together into one place and everyone getting uh, congratulated and a celebration of the partnership of arts and business. I was like, what if the, the awards itself is one installation and each winner receives a part of that piece? So every single award is individual, every single award is a, a piece of the North Sea. Because it's been, I've used fluid dynamics programs and I've created a representation of the ocean at that one point on the North Sea. You see there. The material itself is a material called acetyl delrin. It's a self-lubricating material that you use to make like ball bearings and things and prototyping. And it, it's amazing and the heat it starts to sweat, which is really kind of handy when you're trying to make water. Um, you also can see the machine marks right like here in the reflection. They are completely off by, ch by chance that the machine actually created them and I loved that. That was one of the first times that I actually got involved and actually saw the machine create the pieces. Which is a really highly stressful um, thing. So I congratulations to everyone else who sees it every single day. Like Vanessa was saying, she likes having this kind of this ongoing personal relationship with the machines. I like it, but then I almost get distracted by another one or I distract by something else. Um, I also, if I can make anything by hand, I will never use a machine. I completely, oh, I, I teach product design at Grace School of Art, and you've got all the students going, oh, can we wrap a like this? I'm like, it's a cup. Make it. I mean, you need to know your core, if you don't know your core um, skills, you shouldn't even use the kind of technology. Too many people get seducted by technology. It's not always the right way to go with technology, but it's an interesting way. That's step one. Now, so this is why I rushed through the rest of the portfolio because this is my new body of work called Crossfire. This was uh, this was the first the first proper kind of collaboration. So I worked as the director and I worked for a colleague called Christian Roy and he was the producer. Um, and this came over as a lot of work does over uh, a fine ladder. And we're just discussing the volume or the volume of sound, how sound is the former, or the spoken word, how powerful the word is. What, what happens if I shout at you? Do you all move back? Is the power of my voice or is it the words I use, the articulation of my face? So I was like, well, what if everything in front of us were innocent bystanders? What if they had emotions and feelings? How would tableware, anything work? So we start looking at sound itself. So there's lots of music that comes with this. So. This is one of the first things, it's very MTV, a bit dancey dancey kind of thing. It didn't really work for me, but it got the idea that it, this thing can have its own little movement. It's this particle, it's not fancy, it's a simple thing you can do on a computer file. But it started the kind of idea that maybe you can use this. So, and I was talking earlier on about when you work with friends that are colleagues, they often kind of have a, a, a wrong sense of humour. So I was doing a talk in Copenhagen, and he sent me this, he says, Jeff, I've done this, put this out there, this is just a little kind of sneak bit of what we're working on. I apologise, this is Chris's humour. Once again, it, it, it gave the, 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 the vase a kind of very weird kind of life, but not really the life I was wanting the object, so the vision I had. So we kept them just sitting down and he's like, he, he's like, what do you actually want? And I was like, well, it can't be ambient sound. It can't be, it can't be just like a random song in the background because there's no focus. It has to be directional sound. Now this is on loop, so if it annoys you, oh, wow. Here we go. It has to be kind of directional, it has to be kind of a point and a focus and a, 
a reason why it exists and I can keep on going this whole day. And then I can stop at any point and can create that form. A form I can never even start with. So this whole, this started this kind of idea. Um, I must I must also include that the point of this project was I was working for uh, past, present, future craft practice. I say working; it's a commission, um, uh, which is based in Dundee. And we've currently got uh, my work showing on site. People like John Masseton, who was mentioned earlier on, uh, he's a white side work. Georgina Follett as well. Um, about what is the future of craft? And where does craft come from to create this future? It's interesting. It's a very interesting kind of uh, angle to go at. That's my work. I don't know if it is the future. I don't ever say what I do is the future. Uh, I would never say that. It's completely someone else to decide what is and what isn't. Who knows? Anyway, so this is the point. That this whole direction of volume. But once again, it had no context, and it had really quite a context. So I went for a, a, a film scene. So this is a scene from American View, the Sam Mendes film, 1999. So this idea is three characters. I wasn't killing who the characters were. I was killing that it was obvious traverses to the sign of the past through the table itself. Is that the, the people, things in the, uh, in the table, the candles, the plates, the, uh, the wine glasses, the forks. They were the innocent bystanders. They were caught in the crossfire of the sign. Yeah, everyone hears about sign clashes and things. Stop that. Anyway. I know this off by heart. I've looked at this a year and a half. I can go the whole film probably to you. Um, that's also a good place to stop. Um, so I was always interested. So I was interested in how to make this kind of, not viral, but spam as way. So we started working on trailers and we'll put them on Vimeo and before we start working on the work itself. So this is the trailer and I'll, fit, I'll show the objects that I've created. And a very important thing, though I work in animation, I have to make the object its parent material. If it's a teapot on the computer, it's a teapot made out of porcelain, one child in real life. And that's the point. I don't see the point of just making an RP piece, unless, similar to the candelabra, and the, the one that has no teapot problems, it doesn't exist. So this is why I've been quite careful. This is that for almost $60,000, Pastor Your father seems to think this kind of behavior is something to be proud of. And your mother seems to prefer that I go through life like a fucking prisoner while she keeps my dick in a mason jar under the sink. How dare you speak to me that way in front of her? <laughs> and I marvel that you can be so contemptuous of me on the same day that you lose your job. I don't lose it. It's not like, whoops, where'd my job go? I quit. Someone has to be spared. Oh, 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 oh. So, yeah, I should have wondered, is bad language in the following language? Um, so then from this point, um, I wanted to create artifacts of sound, and I felt that's what was happening. The objects that I was creating were actually artifacts. So, this is the teapot. It's been classed as the ugliest teapot ever made. Um, it's kind of like the John Merrick of teapots. It's uh, I kind of like it. It looks like a turkey. However, <laughs> um, that's not the point. People were like, "Why have you made an ugly object?" And I was like. But have I made an ugly object? What I've done is materialized what sound going through. It was an angry conversation. Is anger actually beautiful? Well, there's a few parts of it, but actually, if I made a, a luxurious teapot, that wasn't the point. There's this whole thing about Pixar, the CEO of Pixar was once talking about emulation and simulation. They were talking about Scully from Monsters Inc. That if they actually created every single hair, on a, like this monster's arm, and there was like millions of hairs, and made every single hair act the way it should, and like scientifically should move, it would look wrong. They animated it to look as we know how it should look. And that was the difference between and simulation, and I really like that, is that perhaps this isn't scientifically correct, however, this insight is familiarity because it's what you feel it's going to look like. The teapot kind of looks like it's been personally offended. <laughs> it kind of offends a lot of people as well. Um, so this piece, these are all these that exist. They're all renders. A lot of people think these are all renders, but I had to get the finish perfect to actually get the whole point across. Um, this is a teapot I love. I love this place. Sorry, it's like a lick. You could you could design that kind of geometry for something. It's a luxurious, sexy feel about it. Um, they're all full size objects. Um, this is actually this is made in glass. And this is I worked with a guy called Jochen Holtz. Bill works in London, and 
I, I've ne never met Jochen. Once again, I emailed him saying, Jochen, I believe you're the best in the business. Blow me some glass. So we, I sent him an RP and he came back with these amazing objects of glass. This is another looking object. I'm going to go quick because I'm running work. So that's another hunchback bowl. And these are wrap prototype, but then <coughs> nickel plated. So they're, unbe they're just unbelievable finish. There was companies in Winchester that made these pieces. This, these aren't the finishes, these are our bad ones that I could send back, but you can see the details that happened with them. So I'm going quickly because I'm going to show you the final And this is a ridiculous jug that I made to do. So, this is the animation. If it's not, if it's somebody, a student, if a student says to me, 
I'll look at a circle, well I know you can cut a circle manually, so they've got to learn the hand skills first before they actually come to me to use the machine. Yeah, it's kind of the cat and dog you can run. Um, and also, I think as educators, you, you've got a responsibility that the moment students leave the kind of cotton will affect the university. They will not have an RP machine or water cart machine at their door. It will cost them a lot of money. So you need to know they need to be resourced from to be able to create the core values. But at the same time, I kind of work with students. They'll have a project and I'll say, you create the file. I'll tell them how to go about it. And then we'll do a project doing that, you know, and, um, but they have to have an understanding of the value of it, um, because cutting for the cutting's sake, nothing, nothing to learn that way. Yeah, that, that, I think that, that's a really good point. Now, there's so much absolute crap out there that's made with technology. <laughs> it's, 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 the whole digital craft thing, and it kind of annoys me in that sense that anything made using a, a, an even small part of CAD is digital technology. Yeah, well, it is, yeah, but it doesn't mean it's any good. Technology does not make innovation. It doesn't automatically make the object unbelievable. It is just a tool. So technology for technology's sake is something that everyone should understand. And something, some, some have a danger that they think it's an easy way out, when actually there's a lot more work often with using the technology than if you'd actually gone out and had to try doing it yourself. Um, you know, programming, cutting, getting everything together. You know, I was saying to the students that I take, I said, if the glass and the plywood's there and the files are in my computer and it's tidy, I will cut it. But if you're just going to give me a sketch on a napkin and say, I need something like this, I'm not going to be drawing and designing it for you. I need the drawing to be as clear and accurate as possible. So I try and treat them like they would be if they were going to go to a job shop or they were going to go to a commercial firm. I want the same, it's, it's no different. So they have, to, they have to learn that process of how they um, communicate what they want and how they engage. Um, you know, okay, they don't pay the same amount as if you would go to a job shop, but they have to get an understanding of the reality of it. Yeah, it's a great expensive machine to have access to. The same with RP, we use RP and five access million and all sorts. But they have to have an understanding of why they're using and what they want to use it for. Otherwise, they go out without that, without that knowledge. And Jack, and how important is it that you make the object at the end? Because you showed the animation at the end, so is that the work? Or yeah, they're both the work. Both, yeah. Um, I have the anime, this is the first time I actually made the animation as an art piece because I usually use animation as a research piece and I show them at lectures and to, to discuss the process. I don't know the sketch in the sketchbook, I make a quick animation and that's it. Um, but this one, <coughs> the animation has to always be shown with the sound artifacts. They work together because the artifacts the one make no sense. The animation is, is intangible and anyone can do that. But the connection, this, uh, that's, what's, that's what's me. So that's my point of view. So we just send the uh, so we we'll send the piece for production to the studio. Uh, does the video go with them to still? Is there a schematic that goes with them? Depending on what's getting sent to the, whatever company is making the work. Uh, if it's just if they are when they're making in ceramic, then I'll send a rough prototype so they have a prototype to work from. Uh, but then they'll they'll start they'll they'll reverse engineer. They'll take it apart. They'll figure out how to make it to mold and things that sense. But then. Uh, they always, they always question well, how the hell we got to this shape in the first place. So they get the animation. <laughs> but I think, this, I think that what's coming out importantly is like even when um, Jeff's gone to the Husky studio and I, I know how the Husky works and I've I dealt with them. But also there's that engagement that you, you say we're going to try it. I have, when I have people like Esther coming, mm. the handwriting, you know, it's, it was so big a program for the software, it kept crashing, but we found a way. You know, to try and put it all through, it kept, kept on crashing. So we found the process, but it's that engagement, you know, Jeff, I think we've cut through it somewhere. Yeah, you took some. I cut some stuff. Um, and you just say, yeah, we'll do it, we'll just try it. You, you've got to have that open. And I think that's why it's been pushing the technology, because we said, actually, we've seen, we've seen a tool out there that we can actually engage with, and now we can just push those parameters further than the engineer thought. And we're just questioning why can't we be using it as fast people or as artists or whatever. Everything's out there for us to use and engage with. We're just questioning it a little bit more. We're just pushing it. I think the um, the glass pieces, they shouldn't have worked. But as you said, the body is say, six inches, seven inches wide. 
and then one of the fins is one mil, all have to kneel at the same time. It should crack in theory. So, but no one had done it before. And that's the thing. That's what perhaps this way of working, I don't, I don't like to say that's what technology allowed me. That was just my initial idea, and technology was the way to get to that. It was the journey. And around the same time, Angela Jarman was doing some work up in Sandman, she was trying to do some really complex castings, had the same issue. Very thick body going to the very thin end, and she couldn't go into work, but you know. The engineers with the hot skis. He is a god. <laughs> so, um, but that's all I can say about that. But I think it's about that openness, openness in learning and, and, and giving that technique away. You know, being able to say, "Yeah, we'll do it."